my nice new brother WP1 word processor. I could connect the Raspberry Pi up to the UART. Okay, that's interesting. You can see that I'm successfully interacting with the Raspberry Pi, sort of. I am actually going to take the time to write a whole new terminal emulator. I think we have most of what we really care about. And of course, once we've done with the state machine, we then have to start work on the actual implementation. That will be fun. So I think I might actually be overthinking this slightly. After looking into the way the various terminal standards work, for our purposes, we're probably okay with VT52, which is a much simpler protocol than VT100. The biggest reason why I want to switch away from the ADM3 is the ADM3 has nasty limitations, like the fact that the cursor keys actually produce uh, these control keys which, uh, if you've ever used Vim, will look strangely familiar. This is not a big problem, but it does mean that application programs can't distinguish between, for example, Control L and pressing the right cursor key, which is irritating. But we can get all that from VT52. So we probably don't want to go the full VT100. However, the extended ANSI sequences that we actually want to implement uh, aren't supported by the VT52, so we'd have to add the support for parsing these anyway. So I think I'm just going to go ahead and push on with this VT100 state machine. Uh, we can always cut it down to a VT52 later if needs be. I think this is going to end up being too big to realistically fit into a CPM BIOS, but as a standalone program, it's fine. Over here, I have the actual Digital Research VT102 documentation from the excellent VT100.net, and it appears that there are more instruction sequences than were in the man page I was looking at. Either that or they're just not in the same order. So we've done G, we've done J and K, but we haven't done H, which is the cursor motion command. So let's just do that. And this is called cup. Now, I also happen to know that F does exactly the same thing. Lowercase f does exactly the same thing. So, uh, let's put the lowercase ones here. Uh, Z do CSI cup. And this wants to go after char. Okay, so this is actually, uh, let me see, what are the order? Cursor to line PL, column PC. So the line goes first. I'm gonna refactor this. Uh, because we can reuse all this code. So this is going to be a routine to so our char here is just going to be like this. 
And likewise, we want a set Y, which is exactly the same, but in the Y direction. So to move to a particular location, we do this. So this is pulling the two parameters out of the parameter buffer, uh, and then it sets them as uh, X and Y. If no parameters are provided, then we go to zero, zero. Now this, uh, the origin is actually configurable by a mode switch, but I don't think we're going to implement that. I don't believe anything actually uses it. Most actual console programs these days, if they do anything at all complicated, they use something like cursors which abstracts over your terminal details. We're going to need a, com a custom term info anyway, so we can just tell cursors not to use origin mode, even if it tries. Okay, so we've got to J, G, H, is there an I, S, I? Be nice if this was in alphabetical order, to be honest. Not sure there is one. Okay, here's setting origin mode. And you see there's a question mark in the command, which means it's not, it's it's private to deck, not technically part of the standard, although I wouldn't be surprised if this is now part of the de facto standard. So. So we've got the CSI set, these are here. Oh, H is in this. I just failed to spot it yesterday. Excellent. Uh, there's no I, so we've done J and K. Right, L. Insert the specified number of blank lines. Interesting, this isn't mentioned here. Uh, that looks like describing VT52 mode, to be honest. Oh yeah, the VT102 can be set to VT52 mode. We're not going to implement that. That just seems like a waste of time. So, and there should be a summary in Appendix C. I'm looking for the cursor. Uh, it's not very. I, mean, I really want just a global index showing all the commands in a row rather than having them grouped into categories. Anyway, cursor motion commands. I think we've actually done all these. Tab stops. I don't know if we need those. Erasing. We've done these. Uh, L and M, insert and delete. Okay. Um, what I wanted to know is actually what they did, but this turns out to be fairly obvious. So, Um, also, I called this the wrong thing. So we want to do el to be do c 
yes I yell so we have two CSIL insert lines So this is a fairly straightforward loop around the insert line primitive. So we need to load the parameter. If the parameter is zero, increment it to make it one. Stick it in B. Insert line. And just loop around that many times. If you try to insert lots of lines it will spend a reasonable amount of time here. Hmm. Hmm. Um, So what we could do is compare against the screen height. If you try to insert more lines than that, then of course you might as well just clear from the beginning of the current line to the end. Let's not worry about that. No one is ever actually going to want to do that. Uh, you're going to be inserting or deleting, you know, one or two lines at most for scrolling up and down. Okay. Delete line. Again, the same but different. And we could probably refactor this. We've done this logic several times before. So having a routine that just you give it a per, you give it a address of a routine and it just calls that routine TTY parameters times would shorten this. But let's stick with this. Okay, delete the number of indicated number of characters on the line and erase the number of characters on the line. Okay. this called ECH not in the ET52 documentation DCH delete characters Right, this is something that we are actually going to need to implement because things will want to use it. The trouble is we can't actually do this without adding a new primitive. 
because the state machine here doesn't know what text is on the particular line. Only the back end knows that. Uh, and I'd rather not add too many primitives. You know what? Let's ignore this one. This is only going to be a subset of the um, the VT102 protocol. And it always will. It always was going to be. Okay. And likewise, there's a whole pile of lower cased ones. So HPR, move cursor right. But we already have move cursor right, CUF. There is no HPR documented there. Uh, lower case C, DA. Yep, implement that. Uh, do we have terminal ID string, right? This is the right string. So we can pull this into its own routine. And this is called DA identify. put the string up by the code that uses it. That way we don't need to define a symbol. So this then becomes do CSIDA Okay. VPA move to the indicated row current column. Not in that documentation. VPR not in that documentation. HVP Horizontal and vertical position. Yeah, we've done that one. Clear tab stop. Implementing tab stops is actually straightforward. We would want a array of 91 bits for each column. So advancing to the next tab uh, advancing to the next tab stop, we just work forwards until we find a set bit or we reach the end. But uh, I'll ignore that just for the time being. I strongly suspect that this is not going to be completely functional the first time round. Okay, modes. This is H. Set mode, see below. As you can see, it takes a numeric parameter, possibly a query private parameter.
the two big ones that I don't know if anyone uses is IRM, which sets insert modes that if you over type into a line, the text sh shifts right. The other one is new line mode, where if you send a uh, line feed character, that's, a that's ASCII 10, does it move the cursor over to the left? or not. Normally not. But again, I think we can get away without that for the time being. And again, we've got reset mode, which is the same thing. Ignore those. Character attributes. This is actually the sequence that uh, was causing us problems. There are lots of character attributes that should be defined here. So, uh, at some point we are going to want to implement them. The This particular uh, video chip actually supports a whole bunch of these, including underscore, reverse video. Uh, it may do half bright, half bright and bold, but for now we can ignore it, because it will be get parsed and discarded scrolling region now when the terminal scrolls you can actually tell it to only scroll within a certain area this is useful for programs that have a top bar or a bottom bar and you want to scroll the text without affecting those without this then the program would have to redraw the top and bottom bar each time excuse me I've got some tea here um, so this would give a much nicer experience for editor programs, which is exactly what I want to use this for, but it's not required because cursors should be able to cope without it. So ignoring. Have we done index and reverse index? That's a... Uh, Yes, we have. Right? No, yes, we have. Right, but we haven't done 7 and 8. Um, so... This says that it saves the cursor and any attributes. Well, we don't have any attributes yet. So this is straightforwardly load cursor x, y, save cursor x, y, and the attributes can go in there as well. Restore cursor and attributes. We simply do this in reverse. and go to update cursor. OK. 
Okay. Uh, media copy. So these old terminals had the ability to plug a printer in so that you would have your terminal plugged into the mainframe in another room but you would have a local printer plugged into your terminal and the uh, the mainframe was capable of printing on your printer by talking to your terminal which is what these are for. Now my brother does have a printer which I'm not using because it's broken, so ignore. It's also really annoying to use, so I would have to figure out all the brother OS system calls to do it. Reports. You can ask stuff about the terminal. So these we've done. R reports the position of the cursor. Whoops, what did I just do? So sending an N with a parameter of six causes the terminal to echo back where the cursor currently is. So we're going to want that. Where's our CSI set? Lowercase n. So uh, device status report. So we fetch the parameter if it is five then we print terminal OK. So this sequence here, so s square bracket zero n. These are private and two with the printer. Right, report cursor position. Right, now this one is tricky because we actually need to write back decimal values. And I found the easiest way to do that is to go and find somebody else's code and use that. What's the simplest 
routine we can find. There's this. Yeah, that seems to be plausible. It may be possible to do um, something with decimal mode, but let's just go for this. So we want to This is a, going to be a generic routine for printing the current value in A. Which this is doing by repeated, yeah, repeated subtraction. Uh, really? Okay. And the TTY type back A routine is a primitive that is going to uh, add A to the output keyboard buffer. It's um, it's the equivalent of this routine, but for a single byte. Right now, this is just. Uh, printing stuff to the console. So, in fact, we can replace this with uh, put C pop HL And then this, we're going to make generic as as this. So now the back end only needs to implement. TTY type back A to push one character into the output keyboard buffer and everything else is dealt with by the state machine. And we're going to want to change this to this. Good, and it compiles. Right, report cursor position. We want to output an escape followed by a square bracket. Now we want to output the cursor Y position incremented by one to convert it back to uh, terminal numbering, one base numbering. Print it out in decimal. Output a semicolon.
print the x ordinate. And final character of the report. Okay. So let's just do a quick test. We want a status report is 6n, 6n. So we run it. And we get type back escape. Type back 5b which is going to be this. Then we get a digit, then we get a semicolon, and then nothing happens. So what's wrong with this code? It has actually emitted a zero here. Wait a minute. Well, it is emitting and leading zeros, which we don't really want, to be honest. The issue is that we call N1. Oh, right. Yeah, this. Yeah, this works by the repeated subtraction. We start by with the left hand side. So each time. Yeah, so it mutates A along the way. It doesn't have to actually uh, save the value of A. So this seems to work. Is 6e the right? 6e is an n. Hmm. Yeah, there is no reason why this should not be printing multiple characters at this point. I mean, it should be flowing through this code here. Wait, uh, an N. It shouldn't be emitting an N at all. If it gets an N, it, right, it's done this. That's what it's doing. Haha. <laughs> this is why we write the tests. Okay, zero, zero, six, semicolon, zero, seven, six, which is correct. We should probably do something about the leading zeros, but uh, I don't think it matters. 
I mean anything that is parsing numbers should be able to cope. So we will just leave that for the time being. Load LEDs, we don't have any. All right, this is VT52 mode, which you don't care about. Okay, I think that's our state machine. All right. So what's next? Well, we need to put this into a actual program and I do have one. Okay, how big is our program? Uh, 12, 39 bytes. Wow. Over a kilobyte of Z80 code, that really adds up. Well, we can actually make it smaller by replacing a lot of these JPs with JRs. Uh, okay, well, this is our test framework running under CPM. I do actually have here a framework that produces uh, bootable floppy images for the brother. So let's copy this code over. Uh, it was in CPM ish, arc brother tools, brother of you one tools, p terms at 80 into vt102 dot z80. Get rid of this, go over here. and load it up. It compiles with this make file and make files are the worst build tool ever. The only thing they have going for them is that they are everywhere. But we can, I, I prepared this earlier. What this does is it compiles the main program here into bterm.image and then it compiles the bootloader uh, and uh, the file system image which refer to these two binary files. Hopefully that made sense. So make Okay, and we do actually want to do some adjustment here. So this is now in relative mode, so we don't want our test program. Okay, it compiled correctly. So if we open uh, the file system image in hex editor, here is our state machine code. These zeros are interesting. I would expect these to be at the end, honestly. Uh, this has done a modular compile and then is calling the LD80 linker to link them together. So here you can see code segment for main.z80 which is empty apart from one ret which is the C9 you can see at the top of the file here uh, and our VT102 state machine then goes below it. So Ah, that's why that's why this stuff appears below the zeros. I never put this back into CSEG mode. 
Okay, well, everything from da here down is our faked up test framework, not test framework, back end. So let's create a new file for that. Um, yeah, display.z80. which we also want to compile, like so. And of course it instantly fails to assemble because we have not imported and exported all our symbols. Now one of the downsides of ZMac is that this is a direct descendant of the assembler and linker from CPM machines and it supports 7-bit external identifiers, which is nice. So we're probably going to want to do some renaming here. And we also want to copy our magic string, like so. So we're actually going to want to rename a lot of these symbols. So it's three, six, so that's seven, TTY cursor for update cursor. Is I think global is correct. So global here exports a symbol. Over here in VT102, we are going to want to import it, like so, and update cursor becomes TTY curse. And that has indeed solved the problem. Now we also want, let's move add AHL into main. This is why add AHL uh, was in capital letters because it's already configured for this. Okay, display. Del line. Insert line. Clear line. In fact, I think TTY is wrong. Because this is not part of the terminal, this is all part of the back end. So let's replace that with DPY for display. So, let's do DPY insert line, delete line, clear line, TTY insert line becomes DPY ins line, TTY delete line becomes DPY delete line. And TTY clear line becomes DPY clear line. No, that didn't work. TTY clear line, DPY clear line. Okay. That's better. We have fewer problems. Uh, type back. 
type back does not actually belong in display because this is part of the keyboard. But we're going to leave it here for the time being. Type back. This is going to become keyboard type. Uh, seven character identifiers is actually an extension. Originally it was six. Keyboard type. So now we're just missing put hex 8 and put hex 16, which are, why is this calling those? Put hex 8 is, ah, yes, uh, the print routines, which I completely forgot about. So the print routines write a character and increment the cursor. So they want to write the character C, so... DPY print. Actually print ASCII, I think, because we're going to have a print Unicode as well. Uh, we now want to move right one with line wrapping. So Uh, we're going to do this. So increment cursor X. If it is at screen width, that means we've, we've just passed the right-hand screen edge. Then uh, then there's nothing else to do. All we need to do is update the cursor position. So once we've passed the right hand edge, we want to move on to the next line. Actually, but this is slightly different, so Right, we actually have the code we need to do that here. So if we, yeah. This is all we need. So to print UTF-8, this is going to be almost exactly the same code. 
So let's do, let's put a label here. Print UTF-8 that lives down here. Print Unicode, advance the cursor. All our Unicode characters are going to be a single character cell wide. It's extremely shoddy Unicode support. Okay, so print Unicode, print ASCII. Okay, the cursor X and Y positions are actually owned by this code here and need to be exported. So the question is, do we want to have the back end have to read them directly or do we want to pass them in as parameters to these routines? Honestly, if they're passed in as parameters, then it makes some of our existing logic simpler. So let's do that. So where are we calling clearL? You see here, for example, we have to reset cursor X and fiddle with it. So let's pass the cursor position in in DE into all of these. These go away because we don't have anywhere to print things anymore apart from, you know, to the screen. So they're just all rets. This goes away as does all of that and that. So this is our back end currently, very simple. Oh yeah, and we also need Print ASCII. And print Unicode. Okay, back to our state machine. DPY clear L, right. Here is our erase code. We're erasing from lines D to E. So we don't need any of this. We can replace this with some much simpler code. Uh, D is actually the Y location. So it's already in the right place. So clear line D. Increment D. Compare it with E.
like this. It assembles. Raise the current line. So here we want to load DE with cursor X. This is a 16 bit read of two 8 bit values. So X is the low byte and goes into E, Y is the high byte and goes into D. And those are the only two places it's used. Curse. Right, this one is actually a little bit more complicated because we're calling this in lots of places. So let's actually replace this with update cursor throughout. Put this one back again. So this then becomes this. So whenever we want to update the cursor, we call update cursor and that loads the appropriate parameters. DPY del delete line. So this deletes this many parameters. Simple enough. Scroll up, this can be simplified. We want to, to scroll up, we want to do delete line zero. Like this. To scroll down, you want to delete the bottom line. like this ins line so again this is the same as below. Now, uh, ins line is only actually going to use D, it's not using E. Uh, however, we can't load D from a 16 bit. Uh, we can't load D from memory directly on the Z80 uh, due to the rather weird unorthogonal instruction set. You can load 8 bit values from memory into A and you can load 16-bit values into memory from memory into any register pair, but you can't load an 8-bit value from memory into a register that's not A. So loading X and Y into D and E here is actually cheaper. Now I come to think of it, is it cheaper? So in order to uh, in order to load DE from a 16-bit value, we have to use this instruction, which is four bytes, ED five B and two address bytes, and twenty cycles. In order to do it through A we would have to load this, so that's 13 cycles, and then do a LD D comma A, which is here, four cycles. So it's actually cheaper to do it through the accumulator. Not a lot cheaper, but it is cheaper. Uh, 
we could push and pop DE to save it, but that is 10 cycles ago. It's shorter code, but it still uses up 20 cycles in both cases. Anyway, let's just go with that. Where else is Dell used? There. Insert line. Yep. Print accumulator. So we put the character in A. And this time we do want both X and Y. So we print that and fall through. Okay. I think we're good. How big is our program? Uh, our program can occupy one track of the disk and each disk is 12 256 byte sectors so this is the first sector of the second track this is our boot sector so we actually have quite a lot of space and we have absolutely loads of RAM Okay. So let's do some of our main code. Now I So this is my old P term. This has got the code to the code in it to actually read from our interface. So we're going to copy some of that. So on entry, we want to reset the interface. And then we start the main loop. And uh, here we go. Right, this is the code for testing to see whether there's anything in the interface. Actually, I can cut and paste this. So this read, this is the bit that reads the character. Then we acknowledge it, and then we wait until we're back in the done state, and then we acknowledge the done state. So instead of calling CPM here, we're actually going to call into our state machine. We're going to call TTY put C. So this actually needs to be exported. Then this code is as it was, like so. And then we loop. And I 
and we need to import it as well. Okay, so that builds. So we should now have a working terminal that is reading characters from the outside world and uh, pushing them through the state machine. I am just actually wondering, this can probably be simplified. Yeah, let's make another file. We're going to put all the interface code in one file. So process from the interface. There's a reason for doing it like that. because that lets us do just ret z to mean that if there's nothing return Okay, uh, let's go back to our make file and add this. And likewise, there's going to be a keyboard file as well. So interface, we want to uh, global int read. And in it, this is going to be so this is all slightly longer code than uh, if we were to just inline it but somewhat easier to read. Int init, int read. TTY put C, it's not called there, but it is called here. Okay. Undefined symbol, prene prenu, that should go. Right, we haven't uh, exposed these. A new. Okay, it compiles. Good. Now, it's not actually going to do anything because we haven't done any of the back end yet. Do I want to do that now or do I want to do the keyboard? Let's do the keyboard. That should be straightforward. So again...
This is going to export keyboard type, which is here. And we want to add it to our list of files. Why is it not liking that? External label defined. Oh yeah, that's to be global, not external. Okay, in yeah, keyboard type is redefined, but it doesn't say where, which is kind of annoying. Okay, now. So keyboard read will, hmm. Keyboard read is going to read the character from the keyboard and stash it into our input, into our output buffer. There's also going to be another routine that takes from the output buffer and pushes it to the interface. Uh, I think we want to rename int read to int exec because it's not just reading from the interface, it's reading and processing a byte from the interface because it's calling putc. Hmm. No, actually. We're not going to do this at all. One of the good things about the VT102 protocol is that zero bytes are always ignored. They're just used to waste time. So we read the byte. Into C and then it stays there until the routine exits. So here in main. We are just going to call into C and then immediately print it. Now this is safe because We're going to test it for zero here. Keyboard type undeclared. Interesting. Oh, yeah. There we go. Keyboard in it undeclared. Yep. And these need to go into our keyboard routine.
and we need to export these. with global and it assembles. How are we doing? Loads of room. Okay, now how's the keyboard actually going to work? Well, it turns out I've done all this work, which is nice. So it's in cpm-ish arc brother wp1 keyboard.z80, it's this code here. So in fact, we're going to stash it on the end here. So this is the code that actually initializes the keyboard produced from reverse engineering. Um, what these are doing is poking various output bits to, as far as I know, enable the keyboard. Uh, I forget what RE stands for. But yeah, the keyboard and the brother is wired up to the synchronous serial I.O. So that's clock and data. So these ports turn on the keyboard itself. And I think this initializes the serial I.O. controller, which is like straightforward. We have a... The way the CPM keyboard driver works is we have a buffer containing a single pending key, which we're going to have to expand on for this code. So let's do some of that. Now we're going to have a, we're going to use a ring buffer. We have, tons and tons of memory. So we're going to use a 256 byte ring buffer because that makes a lot of the maths easier. It means we don't have to mask stuff when wrapping around. But we are going to have a read pointer hmm how am I going to do this? So on the 6502, then I would use an 8-bit offset into the keyboard buffer. But on the Z80, indexing is like that is kind of annoying. That's why we had to do that add AHL thing. So there may be a cleaner way to do this. Let's put a variable in the... data segment. This means that it will be initialized to the address of the keyboard buffer. The low byte is going to be the offset into the uh, No, I'm overthinking this. You know what? I'm just going to use 8 bit bytes. There's a, be a cheaper way to do this, but uh, I'm only going to do that if necessary. Okay, so when we call keyboard read, what we're actually going to do 
is test the keyboard hardware, attempt to read a key, and then push it into the ring buffer. There's then going to be a different piece of code, which is Uh, going to read keys from the keyboard buffer, the ring buffer, and push them out to the interface. The reason for this is so that we can use keyboard type to insert keys into the keyboard buffer. So Keyboard poll here is actually doing most of the work. Yeah, it returns the ASCII key code in A or zero if nothing is pending. Um, trouble with this. Uh, yeah, this is combining scan codes and keyboard codes. The keyboard returns scan code, which you then need to turn into ASCII. For the ADM3, because all keys are one byte long, then we can just treat with, we can just deal with ASCII throughout. On the VT52 and VT100, key report can be more than one character long. For example, the cursor keys return return uh, longer, more complicated values. Here we go. They return these. So Every time you press a cursor key, you're going to have to uh, push three bytes into the keyboard buffer. So what we're actually going to do is... So this is going to read a scan code. Or... That's going to be keyboard exec. We use a keyboard scan code, and if one's present, converts it and pushes it. So the first thing we want to do is to read the scan code, which is this. names, names, keyboard pull, pull into the buffer. So, test to see if there is anything in the uh, a synchronous in, in the synchronous serial I/O buffer. Other, uh, if there isn't, do nothing. If there is, read it into A. And re-enable the interface. It needs to be enabled each time through. So now we want to convert it. This involves keeping a pile of state, which is what these modifier bits are for. Um, I forgot that there is a keyboard table
yes, we can actually use most of this. So let's get rid of this. Keyboard modifiers is our set of modifier bytes. This is our converter, which we will stick here. Like this, move this, move all of this. Now, for the keys that need to return multiple values, our keyboard table, which I will deal with in a moment, is going to return high bit set characters. So um So if the high bit is not set, then this means the value is really ASCII and we just type it. Typing it pushes it into the keyboard buffer. If the high bit is set, then this means it's an extended key and we're going to have to uh, convert it to a multi-byte sequence. So let's just leave it at that for the time being. Now this will not compile. Wow, for many reasons. One is that we need the uh, see we don't have the keyboard map. We don't have the brother include file with all this stuff in it and the Z180 extended characters. So let's copy those first. Oh, we've already got the Z180 include file. So let's just MacLib Z180. Okay, so now everything works except for the keyboard map. The keyboard map in CPM-ish is generated by this C program. Uh, th this just, you give it the scan code and you give it the normal and shifted ASCII representations uh, and it will then generate the include file. So we're going to copy this and then we need to add a rule to, to actually build it So, and then we have to add a rule to generate the keyboard map. Like this. Uh, 
like so. And we need to add a dependency to say that keyboard.z80 requires a key map. Uh, and then we have to include the key map. Let's see what this does. It worked. Well, I got all that syntax right first time. So here it compiles our key map tool and then generates the key map, which is in here. It's just a big array of stuff. Uh, 128 bytes for both. The scan codes from the keyboard use the top bit to decide whether a key is pressed or not. Here are the tables. Hmm. Here is our keyboard buffer. That should really not be there. But we've got lots of space, so I'm not gonna worry about it for now. Okay. So what's next? Type. This is going to want to write the key into the keyboard buffer. And the keyboard buffer is that ring buffer here. Uh, the way ring buffers work is that you have a write pointer and a read buffer that point into the ring buffer. When you write, you well, whenever you write or read, you read the character pointed to by the pointer and advance the pointer. You know when there is nothing to read when the pointers are pointing at each other. And you know when there is nothing... Yeah, let me start that sentence again. A ring buffer is a FIFO queue where you can keep adding stuff on the end and reading from the beginning so that you get out all the data you put in in the right order. It's implemented by having two pointers into the ring buffer and there are they are annoyingly subtle. So one of the pointers points at the Byte. Uh, one of the pointers is post increment and the other is pre increment and I'm trying to remember which way around they are. Uh, no, actually they are both post increment. So yeah, when the two pointers are the same as they are here, this means that the the byte at address zero has yet to be written to and has yet to be read, which means that there is nothing to read. So when we write, we write to this address and increment that to a one. Then when the read comes along, we can see that zero is not the same as one Therefore, it was a byte to read. When things get complicated, it's when you the ring buffer fills up, because then the right pointer has to be less than the read pointer, or rather, not the same as the read pointer. Because if the right pointer advances to such an extent that it hits the read pointer, you run out of space. So, uh, stash the character in C, read
OK. So So what we want to do is to check to make sure that the buffer isn't full. So to do that, we want to see whether the, the right pointer can be incremented. It, if it is equal to read pointer plus one, So decrement our local copy of the read pointer, not the real one, and compare it against the right pointer. OK. So take the right pointer. Find the location in the keyboard buffer. Write the key. and right back. We are only writing the right pointer because here we corrupted our local copy of the read pointer. We can do this in a less confusing way. So take a local copy of the right pointer, increment it, and compare it against the read pointer. That's actually a little bit more uh, clear because what that's saying is if the right pointer cannot be incremented anymore without colliding with the read pointer, then the buffer must be full. And this then allows us to do ink D like this. It'll probably be a bit slower, but it's clearer. Does that compile? We need to fetch this. OK, so we should now be reading ASCII keys from the keyboard and pushing them into our ring buffer. Next job. is to push the keys from the ring buffer to the interface. And in fact,
we're going to do it like this. And, and, I think I've got pull and push the wrong way around because it's natural to talk about the ring buffer. So this is going to be pushing keys into the ring buffer and pulling keys out of the ring buffer. So we want to change this. Uh, keyboard pull is going to read a value out of the ring buffer. Okay, so we read our pointers Return zero if our two pointers are the same. Calculate the address of the read pointer. And return turn it. Uh, undefined symbol. Uh, yes, we have gotten once more to expose. Okay, now we want int write. Check for nothing. Hmm. But of course, we only want to write it to the interface if the interface is writable. So we are actually going to have to query the interface state and only pull the value from the ring buffer and write it to the interface if the interface is actually writable.
So this is actually straightforward. It's this code here. Uh, let's toggle that so that we're going to leave the state. We're going to in the flagged register. We're going to leave Z to be true if that should be writable if the interface is writable so over here in main so if it is not Z skip this okay that's a fairly simple bit of code right the writable code and once again Again, we're going to copy our existing code from P term. Wherever it's got to. Interesting. Oh yeah, writable is zero, so uh, that's not actually necessary because the zero flag will be set automatically by the previous and. So this is the code here. So. We know we know the interface has to be writable from the console, write it to the interface uh, our key is in A, so we can just do output uh, and let me just copy this code here Like so. So I think we are mostly there for at least this bit. Which brings us to the last bit of code, which is the important bit. In other words, the code that actually does the work. Now, this is going to be irritating. So once again, we go look at the brother code. TTY.Z80. This is the code needed to actually write to the screen. The big thing we're going to need is our character table here. This, the brother video memories character set is kind of funky, so this does the conversion. However, the CPM ish code it writes directly to video memory, which, if you remember correctly, was causing us no end of issues. And we so we can't do that. So We are going to uh, define a back buffer which we're going to write to 
and this is going to be flushed to the real video memory whenever it's safe to do so based on the uh, so that we only ever update the screen during the uh, vertical interval refresh time when we know that the video memory is not being read from so we want our screen width and height which are here uh, I'm actually going to add yet another file uh, not ink but lib This they will allow us to include it from multiple places. Maclib constant. And here in our back buffer, we can do screen width times screen height. Now we will actually need two bytes per character for this because we need a byte for the character attributes. That is which font to use, whether you want it reversed, underlined, etc. But we're going to ignore that for the time being. So, just going to leave it at that. Now, how much space do we have left? I think we're okay for space. Let's see, let's just do a, put one of these in. Hmm. So I'm not sure why it's insisting on putting these uh, data segments in line. It's probably... Wait, I know what it'll be. I know what it'll be. Uh, my flags to LD80 are probably not correct. Uh, what's the help like? Not good. Uh, give me a sec while I just go and find the documentation. Okay, I sorted it out. It was in fact, uh, LD80 was doing everything correctly. It's supposed to put the data segments after all the text segments. Uh, this way that you don't need to store the data segments in on disk. I mean, they're all they're always going to be initialized to zero. Uh, However, I had managed to, uh, I had a, I put this in the code segment rather than the data segment. So that big block of zeros I was seeing was the keyboard buffer. But now it's not there. So we should be fine for space. Okay, so this is the uh, this is our back buffer. It's just a simple array of bytes which we're going to copy into the real video memory. It, as our screen is 91 wide, we are actually going to have to create a lookup table to find rows because multiplying by 91 is annoying. Uh, the Z180, which this is, actually has a uh, multiplier, but it's only eight bits wide. It's capable of doing 16-bit multiplication by doing a little bit of basic maths, but I am not going to, because again, we have lots of space, so we are going to create a table
So that's actually going to be back buffer address table. So we should be able to see that somewhere. I think display comes. Oh yeah, here is our character map table, which is there. All of our blank display routines that just have a ret in them is this row of C9s here, which means that our line table is then over here somewhere. And we should be able to see uh, lots of that's not right. Back buffer plus line number. Line number is increasing from zero up. So we should be seeing. This, these numbers are all garbage. Something's not right. I mean, this is wrong anyway. This should be like this. So X, Y, Z, C, C, 9B, C, D, 8F, O, D, and then these should now be the addresses into the back buffer. 803E, 41D3A, 'm in it wait a minute I broken something here looking at this it's it's rebuilt this but it's then not done anything with it um So fs.sim depends on fs.z80. fs.z80 depends on boot sim b termed image. So why hasn't it rebuilt uh, source f80 fs.sim? What does this do? Okay, here's our table, which is all the same addresses. I, wonder if, I think I got my make file wrong. So let's just update this again. No, that's not rebuilding. Ah, oh, well, that's wrong for a start. That's better. That has actually gone and rebuilt everything. This is one of the reasons I hate make files. So let's just do this, make sure it rebuilds. Yes, it's done it. It's gone all the way to the end. Good. So at after our character table, we now have, here we go, 66AD, 66C5, 66DD, 66F5, etc. Good. So what are we going to do with this? Well, in order to print a ASCII value, we want to convert the... ASCII value to brother character set. Uh, 
So we subtract 32 because our table is offset by 32. And then we call our good old friend add AHL. Um, it's not the scan code, it's a screen code. Okay, so now we want to calculate the address of the line. So to do this, we load HL with the back buffer address table, put the our Y value into A and call, yep, is add AHL again. Cursor. Uh, we now want to add on our X, so we put our X location in add AHL uh, in A and add it on again and write our screen code to video memory like this. Renew will ignore for the time being. Right, DPY curse. Uh, this will move the cursor to a particular address in video memory, not the back buffer, but video memory. And I do need the, I do mean the actual address. So we are going to want to copy another table. So over in constant, we want VRAM base, I believe that's 500, and screen stride is 192. Yeah, um, we're using a different memory map, so this isn't the same here. Oh, yep, and, and source constant dot ink. Constant dot lib. Okay. So in order to put the cursor somewhere, we're actually going to have to do some of this, this bit, to calculate the address of the cursor. It's the same math, but using a different table. The video memory screen layout is quite different from the back buffer screen layout, which is why we need two tables. So here is CPM issues code. So here calc cursor you see is basically the same thing. Nope, 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 this is all wrong. So this does not inf <laughs> this calculates the address into the back buffer table. We then have to actually load it.
like this. And we're going to have to do the same thing here. And for the first time, we're going to start poking the uh, video chip using code stolen from CPMish. So this will write uh, HL to the video cursor address in the video chip. And it doesn't like that because I need some of these. These are the addresses of the two ports where the video chip lives. Uh, oh, yeah. I need to also include Z180. There we go. And it compiles. So we should now be able to print characters onto the screen. So we're almost at a point to test the thing. Um, I'm actually going to I'm actually going to copy all abstract this out because we're going to want to use it a lot further down. So we pass in the location in DE and it does the calculation there. So here to delete, let's actually go for here to to clear a line that calculates the address uh, we're then going to use our LDIR trick to clear the clear memory. It's HL2DE, so it's going to be like that. Okay. Insert line and delete line we're going to leave blank for the time being. So we're going to want to do that next. Actually, no, I'm not going to. I'm going to write them because we actually have... Uh, we can't use the CPM-ish code because this is working with um, video memory addresses. Okay, so to delete a line, we want to copy up. Now, I don't think we can use LDIR for that. LDIR always copies in increasing memory order. Can we use LDDR? Yes, we can. Okay, the problem is here that in order to scroll the screen, we have to move a whole chunk of video memory around. To delete a line, we want to move everything up, which means copying everything from line 1 to line 0. 
then from line 2 to line 1, and then from line 3 to line 2, etc. It has to be done in that order to avoid overwriting stuff that we need. So you want to read from a higher address and write to a lower address. So you want to do that in increasing order. OK. So we now have the address in HL. think how we're going to do this. Yeah. Put that into DE. I was looking for 16 bit subtracts. So we want to calculate how much we want to copy. So we've calculated the address, our destination address. We Take our saw. Uh, so the end of video memory minus that address is the is not quite is slightly more than the total amount we want to copy because of course there is nothing to copy into the last line. So we now want to do the subtract. So I think we need to do that. And then we stash the value into BC. Okay, our line address is still in DE, so copy it into HL. Uh, HL is the source. So we actually want to add um, a screen row to that. I run out of registers.
So, by adding on the screen width, no, hang on, we don't. The screen width is an 8 bit value, so we can use our old friend add AHL again, which doesn't touch any registers so that we can actually put our size into BC. Okay. So this should move everything up from the cursor line down, but it won't clear the last line. So the, what we want to do here is Are we on the last line? If so, don't do any of the copy because there's no point. Now we want to blank the last line and this is straightforward because it's basically what we've done down here, but we don't need to actually do any calculations. So get the address of the last line. Address of the last line plus one. Screen width minus one, blank the first character, copy. So the same code happens here. On the first, uh, no, actually, the same thing applies. So, if we are, uh, yes, if we're inserting and we're on the last line. So it is in fact the same code. Then we just blank the last line. So up here, we're then going to want to do all this stuff again, just differently. So, um, in fact, Yes, yeah, source HL target DE, swap HL and DE, um, that in to remind me of the direction because this comment is wrong. So this is going to be uh, So 
So that's copying from line plus one to line. We actually want to copy line to line plus one. but in reverse order. Actually, this makes life a bit easier because these values are fixed because we're copying backwards with LDDR. So the bottom of the screen is always going to be um, at a fixed address. So source is going to be the last line of the screen. Destination is going to be the second last line of the screen. And BC is the amount to copy. but we actually we want to start on the last character of the line because everything's going backwards and do I have my insert and my delete backwards No, no, that, that, I think that's correct. And it can be even assembles. Okay, then. Um, so there are two more important things to do. which is we actually want to initialize our TTY which is to reset the cursor position and the state and clear the screen. And to clear the screen, all we're going to do is call uh, do ed all and then updates the cursor position. Okay. And the second thing we need to do, which is the really important thing, is to actually flush the back buffer 
onto the front buffer. And in our main loop here, we are going to do this whenever we see that we're in the vertical blanking interval. So you see I've got the commented out code here from CPMish that's doing the test. So call dpy flush buffers display dpy flush okay so we need to read the uh, the status register of the video chip and check the vertical blanking bit so if the vertical blanking bit is not set return do nothing because it's not safe to update the video memory at this point. However, uh, if it is set, then we can actually do our copy. And how are we going to do this? Because this kind of needs to be as fast as possible. It's actually probably worth putting in a bit here to detect for a dirty back buffer so that we only do the update if the buffer has changed. But I'd have to go through and... Well, actually, there aren't that very many places to put it. But let's try it without first and just see what happens. Okay, so... For every line we need to copy from the back buffer to video memory according to these two tables here. So, DE is destination. HL is source. to registers so for we want to repeat this screen height times so there's a loop uh, we wish to copy this many times copy so this is advanced DE and HL uh, HL has got our lines packed tightly together, so after we've called LDIR, HL is in the right place. However, DE needs an adjustment. these in. I think it's only a handful of bytes and it simplifies things. Uh, e, E, D. So this will advance D, E to point at the next video memory line and we want to repeat this 14 times 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So what that is this is the same construction I was using down here for our lookup table. Uh, rept causes the assembler to repeat the contents that many times. So by just unrolling this loop we avoid the machinery needed to actually count. That's not a lot, but the fact that we're using all the registers means that we also need the machinery to save and reload our count. And this needs to be as fast as possible, so this should actually help. and it assembles size-wise comfortably within the limit this piece of repeated code here is going to be our flush routine I can actually go and find the out listing? No, I didn't tell it to make a listing. Never mind. Uh, listing, listing. Yeah, listing in Mac is kind of annoying because it's very opinionated about where it wants to put things. Yeah, I would need to uh, pat subst. I want to can change sent.rel for sent.list in the output file. That's actually worked. Amazing. So here we go, display.list, here is the assembler listing of our routine. Now here's our flush and here's the repeated code. Okay, well, now this will almost certainly not work, but, but, it should give us a starting point. This is the boot code. Uh, do I, where do I set the cursor to flash? I think it's CPM issues job yeah it's here we need to initialize the video chip uh, so we actually want a DPY in it, DPY in it, display, so what this is doing is it's disabling the windowed mode which for some reason the brother leaves 
the video chip when you boot stuff uh, and set the cursor to be enabled and flashing. Okay. So I think that is actually ready to test. So I'm going to stop on a cliffhanger and get on to the testing next time. It also means that the people who don't want to watch multiple hours worth of coding can skip straight to the good stuff. Anyway, see you then.